Hi, it's time for another design review, and this time with me in front of the camera, maybe make it a bit more personable. So the last time on the first design review, we looked at this Spartan 7 FPGA board, which is rather cool. If you haven't seen that already, go back to video number 63 on my channel. If you'd like to send in your own design reviews, you can do so by going to fills-lab.net, clicking on contact, and then filling out this form, and please upload your files by WeTransfer rather than sending them directly. And I'll try to do about a design review a month. For this design review in this video, I was contacted by Andrew of Wizard Data, shared his GitHub repo with me. This is a KiCad project, and I believe had the boards manufactured by GLC PCB. It's called the Blue Wizard Mod. I'm not too familiar with it. This is the first time I've pretty much looked into it, so it looked interesting, something different. So let's give that a try. Reading the description, it's an open source Bluetooth controller for the Kinesis Advantage and Advantage 2 line of keyboards. I haven't really heard of them before but potentially some sort of adapter that makes it Bluetooth capable rather than just being a USB keyboard, I would assume as a first guess. So there's been some troubleshooting and some, and some description of the project. I haven't really looked through this. I'm more interested in the hardware and PCB design to see what Andrew's done well and maybe things we could improve on. I believe he also has an Etsy store where he sells this and he's also shared several pictures with me of the finished product. I believe he might've hand assembled these so it looks like a two layer board, nothing too complicated, some sort of ESP32 or some Bluetooth capable MCE or something like that. Thank you very much to Altium for sponsoring this video. If you'd like to give Altium Designer a try for yourself, you can go to altium.com forward slash YT forward slash Phil's Lab to get yourself an Altium Designer free trial and 25% off your first license purchase. To help you to get started with Altium Designer, I've published a less than three hour video giving you a complete walkthrough of Altium Designer on the basis of an STM32 PCB. And I'll leave the link to this in the description below. I'll be producing videos for Altium Academy, to, so make sure to subscribe to their channel for PCB and electrical engineering content. I've downloaded the design files in KiCad and I've opened the project. So it seems to be one schematic page. First things I like already, are the segmentation. So even though it's just on one schematic page, I like that Andrew has segmented it like so. And so I'll just go through in fairly random order. This is not a you know strict design review. I'm just glossing over and seeing some things I like and seeing some things maybe we could do a bit better. So that's at the top. First thing we have some LEDs. I assume these will connect to some microcontroller and so forth. What I'd like to do is probably indicate what color these are. So rather than just saying, you know, LED, 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 maybe give us a color, this is an indication. And also the resistor values, R1, R2, R3, Andrew's written them as one kilo ohm here, but on the right side here, R5 is 100K. So stay consistent, I would preferably go with 100K rather than saying kilo ohm. Units of resistor are pretty universal, so there's no sense in writing ohm. So I'll change that 1K, 1K, 1K. 1K, depending on your brightness, I assume this will just be in an enclosure, maybe for just for testing. So 1K seems like a fair value for resistor. Okay, moving on to the right side. Sorry, this is a fairly random order. We have this kind of switching circuitry so that you're kind of oaring these voltage inputs of so five volt oared with bat. Only one of them will be on at one time. I don't like these four bar nodes, especially there's no space. If I move this capacitor, you can see its pin end is right on the junction. And I'd prefer to just wire out a bit and then connect that up. Avoid four bar junctions because it's hard to see what is actually connected. Then we have some sort of enable jumper over here. It would be nice to indicate what that is on the schematic. If it's a jumper, if it's a connector, where that's hooked up to. Input out capacitor is one microfarad. So I assume for this regulator, that's probably fine. I would have to check the data sheet you know, for stability. You want to make sure that these LDOs will be stable. Ground is pointing down, I like that. I would like to see labels rotated so I don't have to turn my head. And VCC, any positive of potential with regard to ground, I would like to be facing up, for example, like so. Same goes with the five volts on this side. So there's a LiPo charger, it seems. So program to ground, this resistor will probably set the charging current. Again, I would please encourage people to keep their text horizontal. I have to check the data sheet, what the charging current will be. It would be nice to have a note just annotated on the schematic, okay, telling me two kilo ohms gives me, you know, 50 milliamps, 100 milliamps of charging current. 4.7 microfarads at the input. Again, F are farads, so we don't really need. A capacitor will be in farads anyway. Also, I don't like doing 4.7. What I always do is, for example, 4U7. The dots can be sometimes hard to see and can cause errors. So 4 micro 7. Here we're using a 470 ohm resistor. Before we had one kilo ohm resistors. 
know that I'll have a different brightness. Okay, these might be driven point 3.3 volts, and this is driven from 5 volts, so this will be brighter anyway with this 470 ohm resistor. So why not make them all 1 kilo ohm? So we have a reset circuitry with some debouncing battery cell LiPo monitoring. I would preferably put all this LiPo monitoring together. So the battery, I would move that over to where it's supposed to be. And then also this resistor divider with the filter, I would place that you know directly at the battery. Group things together. There's no reason to split the schematic out like this. Also this reset circuitry, where does that belong to? I assume to one of these microcontrollers, this one up here, there we go. You can place that directly next to it. There's no reason to segment it this much. Okay, so he's chosen fairly high value resistors to step this battery voltage down to you know something that the ADC of the microcontroller can read. B monitor, this is a global flag and should be set to output rather than input and then make it a bit neater as well. So it'd be nice to indicate what the cutoff frequency is of this filter since it's essentially it's a parallel combination of R, these two here in the, with C, one over two pi that. Fairly large resistor values. I don't know if 806K is a standard resistor value. So I just Googled standard resistor values and, you know, I would probably go with 820 kilo ohm just to make sure, you know, it's not of a more expensive part that it needs to be. So 820K and two mega ohms. And then also write down what that scales to or what the nominal battery voltage is. Then we have some sort of connectors. C4, so these are all the keys, I would guess. I would like to see unused pins. Of course, this depends on the pin out of the keyboard this is plugging into. Maybe this is already defined, but I'd like to see, you know, return paths because all of these signals, because they don't have a ground return, will return in each other. So this is bad for signal integrity, EMI, and so on. So remember your ground and power connections on your connectors. I'm avoiding the microcontroller, just doing the rather peripherals first. So here we have a serial wire debug connector. Again, with global flags, it'd be nice to indicate directions. So zero wire debug, okay, that might be an input, but zero wire data is bidirectional. You know, indicating some sort of intent on the schematic would be nice. We're also lacking ESD protection, which we might be good to add in case there's a lot of interfacing. And here we have a USB-C connector. It's using USB 2, not USB 3. I would like to see net names labeled. So for example, this labeled as USB CC1 and this one then is USB CC2. It'll just help you when it comes to layout and routing your PCB later on. Then we have a USB to UART converter or transceiver IC. I guess this will be used for programming of the microcontroller. And I would hope everything is hooked up properly. What I am missing though, uh, I think reg in, I would assume needs another bypass capacitor, maybe microfarad, 100 nanofarad. So this seems like it's missing without knowing the data sheet. And I'd probably place another 100 nanofarads next to VIO rather than, than just at VDD. Okay, so I hope that's wired up correctly. Again, this is not a thorough design review. So here we have an NRF52832. So I don't like how this symbol is made. I assume this was just downloaded off the internet. A lot of symbols will just copy the layout of the actual footprint. So going from one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, all the way around the actual footprint. And to me, symbols, schematic symbols should be grouped logically. So all the ground should be pointing down, all the power should be pointing up, IO grouped in certain sections, for example, serial wire debug together, all the maybe ADC channels together and so on. So I don't like this symbol design. Driving this microcontroller or this module with a CMOS oscillator, and this is missing a bypass capacitor, so it needs about 100 nanofarads VDD to ground. And typically I'll also place a series resistor on clock out, just in case I have any problems uh, with ringing or emissions, very sharp edges, and that can kind of slow that down. Even though this is probably its own contained module, I would still add, you know, maybe a larger decoupling or bypass capacitor to the power pin, something like 10 microfarads or so on. That'll always help regardless if it's the module or not. But other than that, I think it's quite a, you know, quite a clean schematic, so I do like that. A lot of the comments I've made are mainly aesthetics. Of course, missing decoupling capacitors aren't great. It's, a, it's definitely a good, good attempt. So let's look at the PCB now. So we have the PCB now open. Looks like it's a two layer PCB, front and back. Okay, so let's just go through one by one. I'm just gonna point out the things that are immediately obvious to me. Let me just hide the ground pores like so, and let's just look at the top layer to start with. First of all, there's lots of space. That's always nice for PCB design because that means we can spread out. And that doesn't mean we can spread out. It means we should spread out. So you can see all these very closely grouped lines. You know, they're spaced out 0.15 millimeters. 
Even though the board house can probably do that, there's no reason to just group all these lines together. So I take it for crosstalk, for noise, for manufacturing, you know, this could go wrong. You have so much space here, why not spread it out? And this is something I see a lot in PCB designs that people do not want to space out the lines even though they clearly have the space. I mean, this also doesn't look good to me, purely from an aesthetics point of view. Also this, this kind of hugging of traces near the pads, I'm not entirely sure what that's about. So the first thing is always spacing, spacing, spacing. This is, doesn't matter if you're a beginner or you're doing the simplest board or the most complicated board. Try to get as much spacing as you can within reason. So don't go right next to the manufacturing capabilities. And I, I really don't understand these hugging, you know, going really close hugging these pads. This is going to be really hard to produce, like these through hole with these plated through holes next to these traces, and that's very, very close. So that's the first thing I would definitely want to see changed because that isn't great. The next point are these power and ground connections. So on the top layer, we have a VCC fill, and on the bottom layer, I would hope we have a ground fill. Yes, we have a ground fill. Okay, so we can basically always veer down, veer down and connect to the ground pane. Regardless of that, what we want is wide as possible traces and close vias to the pads. So the proximity of this via to the pad is fine, but the trace or the track size isn't. It's 0.2 millimeters. So I want something maybe like 0 0.4, 0 0.5, basically as wide as the pad, right? And I want that for all of my ground connections. Ideally, I also want one via per ground pad. Also spacing between vias and tracks is very, very tight. So this isn't great. The crystal is a rather interesting package the top trace is actually connected to the top copper layer of VCC like so, and I'd really recommend a decoupling capacitor next to that. Also the way the way this trace of this crystal comes out of this pad, I would always avoid these triangular shapes. Instead, root out of the pad, come up and root out like so. There we go, nice right angles of the pad entries, and that's what you want. I like though that the distance is kept close to the relevant IC or the module, so that's good. Same thing goes with these pads, ground, vias as close as reasonable with wide traces. Also, there's these resistors floating around. It would be nice also aesthetically and to group them a bit more. Here's the regulator, which is connected again by these copper poles. What I'd want to see also with LDO regulators, let me just go through these tracks. So I'd prefer to have my layout, for example, something like this and the output capacitor, maybe something like this, just as very crudely done. I want my loop areas as small as possible. So my input loop, is this pad one and one and pad two and two and ground. My output loop is pad five and pad one and ground essentially all centered around this node. Compare that to the layout before, you can see I have these huge loops with these very thin traces and this is definitely not recommended. Also, there's no reason why this V has to be out so far, why not pop it somewhere like so. Preferably in this kind of two layer board, I'd probably make the top copper layer ground rather than VCC and then just root out my power and then stitch the top and bottom ground plane together. You get better returns. Let's go to the USB routing. The first thing I see are these vias with impossibly small annular rings. So the manufacturer must have edited these to actually make these manufacturable. You can see the V diameter is 0.4 and the via hole is 0.3. Typically for drilling vias, you will drill about, you know, 0.1 millimeter larger than the actually specified hole. So they'll drill at 0.4 millimeters and plate down to 0.3 millimeters. So having a via diameter of 0.4 is pretty much impossible. So they'll have, and you basically have 0.05 millimeter annular ring. So that's almost, that's impossible to manufacture with standard technologies. So vias have to be, have a larger annular ring. I typically recommend, you know, 0.15 or something that larger. Somewhere this is pushing it. I'd probably go with, I usually go with a 0.7 and 0.3 millimeter um, via, if it's a 0.3 millimeter hole, and then of course move that out a bit. Also V and pad, not a great idea. Wix sold it away, and typically board houses will charge you more for that. Also, the distance from the serial wire debug connector to the actual microcontroller module is rather large. Maybe it's mechanically constrained, but I would prefer to put that programming header as close as possible to the relevant MCU. It might be in my library so that I haven't linked properly, but we don't have any 3D models. And for mechanical checks, I think this is very important. I like that Andrew's added silk screen, even though it could be maybe aligned neater. So everything horizontal or in one direction vertically. We also have some silk screen which is almost overlapping. For example, SW1 and reset. Here we have silk screens overlapping and it looks very thick compared to the text height. Also, we have silk screen on copper and that's simply not manufacturable. And it's a good idea to get rid of that in your design rather than letting a manufacturer do that. And under the antenna part of this module, we have removed copper 
which is probably necessary. I would probably do a cutout of the whole PCB underneath this antenna. But of course, check the data sheet, check the application notes. Lastly, on the topic of copper pores, we have front copper is VCC and back copper is ground. Now, if we just check out the back copper, one layer of any two plus layer PCB should at least be dedicated to a solid ground plane. The way it's divided up here is that we have large cuts and splits in this ground plane. So these cuts and splits, these, these, and so forth, meaning return currents will have to travel longer paths. There will be more radiation, EMI, and noise issues as well. If you have to gap, for example, this section, dig down, and as soon as you can, dig up again. So we can decrease this cut by a significant amount just by digging up as soon as we can again and trying to keep our jump small. We would be aided as well if we used ground straps or had a ground layer on the top layer so we can essentially bridge these large cuts in the ground plane. So that's something you really should avoid is large cuts ground plane. Of course, two layer boards, it can be difficult, but one should make an effort to try and do that. So this is a very brief design review. Thank you, Andrew, again for sending this in. We can see there's quite a few things from a PCB design perspective we can improve on. The main things always being clearance, spacing, trying to make it neat, via sizes, the usual suspects. If you'd like your design analyzed or checked out briefly by me, please do send them in. Thank you, and I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Bye-bye.